Welcome to Rebuilding the Republic, conversations about America's future here at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. We're thrilled to be here with social and political commentator, Ross Douthat. In 2009, Ross became the youngest op-ed columnist in the history of the New York Times. As a Catholic and conservative commentator for America's center-left newspaper of record, he plays a crucial role in America's intellectual life, challenging the assumptions of a liberal readership, promoting rational dialogue between right and left, criticizing what he sees as lazy thinking and extremism on both the right and the left, provoking, stimulating, and forcing readers of the Times to refine and adjust their arguments. He's written books about Harvard University, the Republican Party, Christianity in America, and Pope Francis. His new book in paperback is The Decadent Society, America, Before and After the Pandemic. You can read more about him and the book here on this page. You can also purchase a copy of The Decadent Society via a link to an independent bookstore here on this screen. Ross, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, it's a pleasure. So before we get into the book, what's it like to be a conservative who writes primarily for a liberal readership? Is it a thankless job or? I mean, generally it's a um, in the sense that if you're in my line of business, which is basically arguing for a living, um, your goal should presumably be to have as many people reading your material who are sort of available to be convinced as possible. And so writing for people who you disagree with is the whole point, I think. Um, so in that sense, I'm very lucky to be in the position I'm in. Um, obviously, you know, I think the Trump era, especially sort of some of the changing dynamics of internet life, um, have made certain aspects of my job a little more fraught, maybe, than they were when, when, I, when I started out. Um, but I'm still here and most of the time still enjoying myself a great deal. So for us liberals in, in, in the Trump era, it, it often seems like the right isn't worth talking to anymore. Uh, why shouldn't we think that way? Well, I mean, look, there, you know, I, I was part of the large band of conservative commentators who opposed Donald Trump when he ran for president and uh, didn't, didn't vote for him in 2016. So I'm not in a position to tell you that the American right is in amazing shape and <laughs> that the Trump era was one triumph after another for conservatism. I, I obviously don't think it was. Um, and there are sort of aspects of um, sort of Republican political narrative, uh, you know, especially, for instance, uh, you know, some of the president's wilder claims about election fraud that I think it's safe for liberals to dismiss. Um, but if you're only having, if you, if one of the, one political party or one political coalition goes off the rails in some way or another, that's actually the moment at which people who are sort of want to be serious thinkers in the other political coalition should be working harder to sort of test their own ideas against the strongest rejoinders and rebuttals. Um, and look, the reality is that, that, that whatever has happened to the Republican Party, the Democratic Party has moved substantially to the left over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, certainly it's well to the left of where it was under Bill Clinton. And there's been, I think, a certain sort of consolidation of what you might call progressive certainty um, in elite institutions, whether there are newspapers or magazines or um, the academy, the higher education. Um, and there are real risks of sort of groupthink hubris, um, ignoring reality in various ways um, that come with that kind of consolidation. So I think it's in certain ways, the, the chaos and disaster inside the Republican coalition have created a great temptation for liberals to sort of assume that they can just be the intellectual world unto themselves. And temptation that's a temptation that should be resisted, I think. So almost anyone who picks up a book called The Decadent Society by, by a Catholic commentator is going to expect a, a sermon about traditional sexual morality and family <laughs> values. And, and, and your, your book is, isn't that. Can, can you tell us what you mean by decadence? Yeah, th that was my last book. This is, 
this is something completely different. So yeah, I, I use decadence, which is, as you say, a term that's often associated with sort of orgies and trips to Las Vegas um, to mean, I think something broader and more interesting in a way, um, to mean periods of stagnation, drift and repetition that set in for societies that reach a really high level of wealth um, and technological development. So basically I'm using decadence to describe what I think has happened across the last 40 or 50 years of American and really Western history, um, which is not a period of sort of looming collapse and total disaster, but it's a period of slowing economic growth, technological change that has disappointed everywhere except the internet, obviously, or otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, um, political gridlock and sclerosis, demographic decline. It's a striking fact that basically every rich society in the world right now is not having enough children to reproduce itself. And then finally, and this one's a little harder to prove statistically, but um, a kind of cultural repetition that, you know, I like to invoke the sort of the complete takeover of the movie business by superhero franchises and Star Wars, sort of recycled Star Wars stories as a very vivid example of this. But I think in general, there's been a kind of uh, you know, a, a kind of repetition, a kind of cultural rut that has set in since sort of the peak of uh, baby boomer creativity. So all that is what I'm calling decadence. And, and, you know, the book came out just at the start of the pandemic. So it was a moment, uh, the pandemic was not decadent. 20 was not decadent in the way that I define the term. But I think most of the trends and forces that I'm describing are still there. Um, in as we hopefully stumble out of the COVID era and are still likely to shape Western society going forward in various ways. Yeah, so, so if, if we can talk a little a little bit more about the the pandemic, I, I think for you know for many of us it feels like during the pandemic the the world is is changing at, at breakneck speed and we're we're entering the beginning of a, a strange new phase in human civilization of, of remote and virtual life. So, you know, how, how, can we, how can we believe you that we're in a period of stagnation? Well, so you shouldn't believe, I mean, you shouldn't believe that we're in a period of stagnation in, in the specific terms you're describing. I think the pandemic has had a couple of presumably significant effects. I think it's accelerated certain technological trends. Um, the, the, you know, the race for the vaccine is likely to lead to some other medical breakthroughs as well. And there's a possibility that the 2020s in general will be a better era for sort of breakthrough innovations than the past 20 years were. Um, and then, as you say, there's been there's been a sort of temporary total restructuring of the economy where we've been, you know, sending people checks and everyone's been working for home and from home. And some of that will go away over the next year, but some of it will stay with us. And there will be changes from that, um, changes in which cities flourish, uh, changes in people's ability to work outside major cities, sort of geographical redistributions that'll, that will be very significant. So all that is, is, ch is real change and it's not decadent. On the other hand, the pandemic has had other effects. So it's had social effects, right? That at least in the short term tend to deepen decadence. People are having fewer, even fewer children now. We've had a pandemic baby bust sort of piled on top of the, pre, the already existing fertility decline. Um, kids are living at home longer for obvious reasons. They're less likely to date because it's hard to date. They're postponing weddings. Um, you know, we're in a world where it seems like sort of basic human relationships have become harder to form and the pandemic has not exactly helped with that. Um, so in terms of social life, I think it's the, the pandemic has potentially deepened decadence in certain ways. And also in terms of some other cultural aspects, right? Like if you, if you think about what the pandemic has done to sort of art and pop culture and so on, it's been really good for what you might call the content industry, right? Because everybody's, everybody just wants to watch whatever's on Netflix or the 17, you know, the 17 new um, 
uh, sort of plus Disney plus Paramount plus all, all of these things. Uh, but it's been really bad for your local symphony, your local art museum. Um, it's probably been bad for minor league baseball and, um, uh, you know, sort of it's been bad for church going. It's been bad for small churches. It's, so if you go through a lot of, uh, I think, cultural institutions that are not, you know, not in Hollywood and not benefiting from the content boom, they've been substantially weakened by the pandemic too. And I think that too is a sort of deepening of decadence. And then politics, it's too soon to tell, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I, I think it's, I, I think in certain ways, economically and technologically, the pandemic has probably sort of created some openings to escape from decadence. Socially and culturally, it may have deepened it. So in, in writing courses, uh, we're always teaching that writing is revision. And you revised this book pretty substantially for, for the paperback edition. Why'd you do that? And how important is revision? Um, is, is it more than our writing practice? Is, is it almost a, a philosophy of life? Well, I mean, I'm a newspaper columnist, right? So I write twice a week about the news and especially in a period as unexpected as the last year and really the last five or six years have been, you have to, you have to be a, revis a reviser, <laughs> I guess, um, because otherwise you're, you know, there's no way to, to be right about everything in a fluid, swiftly changing moment. And if you aren't willing to sort of take new information into account and sort of revise your worldview and your understanding of things, um, then you're not going to be much use as a commentator. And I, I think a lot of people have sort of revised their views. American politics, you know, you have a lot of conservatives revising their views because of this or that aspect of the Trump era. So, so yes, to your sort of general question, revision is essential to any writer, but I think it's particularly essential to those of us who sort of write inside the flow of the news. Um, for the book, I mean, part of it was just to take into account the things we just talked about with, with your last question, right? To sort of try and figure out very provisionally which of the aspects of decadence I'm talking about have gotten worse and which have maybe sort of gotten better um, in the last year. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting choice with, with books like this. You know, you can leave the book as it is and just sort of write a new introduction or a new conclusion so that the book sort of remains this kind of artifact of one year ago and then the conclusion sort of takes things further. I didn't do that. I sort of wrote through the manuscript and put in, you know, a new paragraph here, revised a take there, sort of conceded some ground here and there. But it's all, you know, the fluidity of the world is, is a challenge even, even in that process because I, you know, part of the book is about is talking about, you know, to what extent are our politics sort of virtual and performative? To what extent is, you know, everyone is sort of acting like it's the 1930s or the 1960s on Twitter without having that spill over into the real world. And, you know, in 2020, in the summer of 2020, it obviously did spill over into the real world. We had real protests and real riots on a scale the U.S. hasn't had in a long time. So I had to write about that. But then when the election rolled around, there was sort of a prediction that you would have, you know, more violence, more riots, and nothing like that happened on election day itself. And so in the paperback, I said, well, you know, this shows maybe that there was this sort of temporary sort of exceptional moment created by the lockdowns over the summer that then, you know, had gone away by the fall. But between the time I finished the paperback and when it actually um, came out, we had the January 6th riots in, in the Capitol, which were, again, a case of sort of the virtual becoming real, the, you know, online conspiracy theories and fantasies sort of suddenly, you know, taking flesh and a guy in a Viking suit is, you know, in the, in standing, standing in the Senate. So there's, history is always moving, even when you as a writer are sort of trying to stand outside it and, and describe it. Um, and no revision can perfectly capture that, I think. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to ask this, but I, I think students will will find it interesting. Um, you, you write about, you know, kind of cultural staleness and repetition, and you are a film critic. Um, and I wondered whether you, you could talk a little bit about your take on on the Marvel Universe and uh, and the Star Wars, you know, franchise. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm against them, I guess, which probably isn't a popular opinion with your students, although who knows, um, maybe it is. I, I'm, I, I was a huge Star Wars fan as, as a kid, and like a lot of people, was disappointed in the prequels that George Lucas made and was sort of excited to see what a different set of directors would do with the material for Disney. Um, but in the event, what happened with Star Wars, which I think people basically acknowledged by the time Rise of Skywalker rolled around, was just this sort of this this classic sort of aspect of decadent culture where um, the people making the movies said, well, George Lucas tried to do something new with the prequels and it didn't work. So so we're just going to make the same movies again. We're going to have things that look like Death Stars and plot arcs that end with the Emperor coming back and all, all of these kind of things. And so the new movies, the J.J. Abrams movies, are basically just the original trilogy sort of redone in various ways with better special effects and slightly worse storytelling. And I think that's that's sort of... Uh, a kind of profound example of what what decadence is decadence is it's doing you know it's sort of avoiding taking risks doing the same thing over and over again not just sort of doing pastiches of old stories but literally doing the same stories and marvel isn't as egregious as that the marvel movies are better than rise of skywalker for instance ended up being but in marvel you see you know this sort of this sort of narrative that is perpetually stuck somewhere around age 13 or age 14. Like the, the superhero movies are sort of sexless stories in which people are like adolescents always sort of discovering their powers and, you know, sort of feeling themselves to be filled with new powers and discovering what they can do with them. And then you have sort of the same plots of, you know, superheroes versus supervillains. And there are exceptions. You know, Logan, or to some extent, Black Panther, that take things in interesting directions. But in general, the what what's happened with superhero movies is just that the kind of talent that you know even twenty years ago would have gone into making you know a sort of broad range of high middle brow movies for adults um, goes into making really visually impressive, um, somewhat psychologically empty. Um, lavish entertainments and they're not bad they're very impressive um but that's sort of what decadence is it's not bad in some ways it's impressive but it's a falling off from what you actually want art to be and to achieve so many uh of us on on all parts of the political spectrum uh would agree that this nation needs to be reunited in common purpose and you propose the, the space race as a model for a common purpose, uh, reaching for the stars, both, both literally and metaphorically. Can, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the space race in certain ways, obviously there was, we had it easier in the sense that it was a Cold War project where the purpose of going to the moon was always somewhat undefined except in the sense that we knew we wanted to beat the Soviets there, right? So it's a little harder to sort of generate the energy for that kind of project if you aren't also engaged in what seems like an existential competition. Um, but fundamentally, you know, modern societies, Western societies, now all societies the world over, because sort of we have a kind of world civilization now, have been oriented towards discovery and exploration and development. And the space race was, was supposed to be a space age. It was supposed to be this sort of opening of the frontier um, where now that we'd sort of filled in the map of the world and there weren't any places left to discover on earth, we were going to spread outward through the stars. And I don't think it's as simple as saying like, you know, because we couldn't go into space, we started hating each other more. That's, that's an oversimplification. But I think there's, it's not a coincidence that once it becomes clear that we're not going to colonize the moon or Mars overnight, and lots of people aren't going to go into space, and this isn't going to be this sort of grand, you know, human project that people expected it to be, that that realization sort of coincides with a turn towards cultural pessimism, disappointment, sort of feeling of ennui and purposelessness that I think haunts our current civilization. So 
I, I do think America would probably be in better shape if Mars were slightly closer and had a habitable zone that we could, you know, that, that we could sort of be sending ships towards right now. And maybe Elon Musk will get us there yet, but it seems it still seems quite a quite a ways out of reach. This is all very forward looking and many of us think of conservatism as as backward looking and, and nostalgic for the past. Is, is there a paradox there or not at all? No, there's some well, there's some interesting tensions, I guess you could say. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the book and my arguments are nostalgic in a sense, but they're sort of nostalgic for the future. That's the that's the the quasi paradox of it, right? That they're sort of nostalgic for a time in which the future seemed like it was going to be bolder and wider and more creative than the actual early 21st century future that we've that we've ended up with. So there's a sort of complicated kind of nostalgia there. Um, but I, I mean, I also tend to think, you know, conservatives in the U.S. have historically had this idea that you could sort of put together libertarianism and social conservatism, right? That you could have a sort of religious traditionalism and this kind of, you know, Ayn Randian um, sort of hyper individualism. And philosophically, those don't really go terribly well together. But I do think there's sort of a mysterious way where a kind of dynamism and a kind of traditionalism can actually go hand in hand. That uh, sort of traditionalism depends on kind of reinventions, right? If you're, you know, whether it's a, a church or religion or a community or a family, um, you need to sort of reinvent traditions under pressure from dynamic dramatic change. And that hasn't really been happening in the last 30 or 40 years. And so instead you have this kind of, you have a different version where you have um, less, less dramatic economic and technological change. And then the sort of traditional institutions decay too. People go to church less, institutional religion declines, the family declines, people stop having kids. So I think the fact that you can have dynamism and traditionalism decline together means that maybe conservatives were onto something in saying that they they go together better than philosophically you might think. So our, our students come from every part of New York State, from the multicultural cities that voted overwhelmingly for Biden to the rural counties that voted overwhelmingly for Trump. What, what's the best way for all of us to, to talk to each other? Do, do you have any advice for us? Well, I mean, first, you want to assume that politics is not the most important part of sort of your identity and the way you communicate with other people. And I mean, I mentioned sort of the decline of religion in the United States. But one thing that's happened lately is it's you've had sort of religion itself declines and then religious energy gets pushed into politics. So in the way that once, you know, a Catholic parent might not want their kid marrying a Baptist or a Jew, now you have Republican parents who don't want their kids marrying Democrats and vice versa. And I think that's a very bad trend for the country. I think the promise of a society like America, which has, you know, 300 million people and counting all living together in you know, in one in one one country as sort of one national community is that you should be able to live your life and have friendships and have sort of normal life and think about politics, you know, every two to four years when it comes time to cast a vote. Um, and I think, you know, for, I mean, when I went to college, most of my friend, I was a conservative then, most of my friends weren't conservative. I had a group of conservative friends who I hung out with and, you know, we said conservative stuff to one another, I guess. But my other friendships were mediated by totally different issues. They were, you know, mediated by, you know, being Red Sox or Patriots fans or, um, you know, the girls we had crushes on, the movies we watched together, the beers we drank, all that kind of thing. And I think, you know, for college students, especially starting relationships with politics sort of way in the background is a much healthier way to relate to people who, you know, if one person comes from the Bronx and the other person comes from Binghamton, um, you know, or Tupper Lake, <laughs> don't, don't make politics the basis of your identity when you first collide with and communicate with people from places different from yourself.
For, for many of us, um, religion often seems outdated and entirely mythological. Um, how can religion be good for us? How can it even save us in, in your view? Well, I mean, I don't think it's outdated or mythological, right? So uh, to me, the way it's relevant is that it's quite likely to be true in some form. I think it's very likely that God exists, the supernatural is real, um, and that these things shape human life in all kinds of ways, even in a secular age. And I tend to stress that point because, you know, people who write about religion like me for a secular audience, you know, you tend to get into this kind of, you know, sort of detached view where you say, well, religion is really important because it's a way of building community, right? And America depends on strong communities and churches have traditionally been a source of social support and you know, help people help build flourishing communities and happy marriages. And so we should care about religion independently of whether it's true or not. And you know, that I think that's true sociologically. I think you know, religion has been this incredible sort of social glue for for American communities over you know, the hundreds of years we've, we've existed as a nation. And so the decline of religious community is bad for even the secular parts of society. But people don't, you know, I mean, especially young people, you don't make choices about whether to go to church, whether to get up on Sunday morning, whether to commit yourself to your identity as a Muslim or a Jew based on those kind of sociological generalizations. Maybe you do at some point in your life when uh, you know, you're moved to a new town and you need to start networking because you're running a business, you join a church. I mean, people join churches for all kinds of reasons, but fundamentally, the reason to be interested in religion is that, you know, life is hard, you're going to suffer, you're going to face all kinds of complex challenges, and someday you're going to die and so are everyone else you love. And, you know, if there is a God, it's a pretty important thing to be interested in for those reasons before sociological ones. So we're, we're very, Chance. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're, we're no, very, I just, I, I just asked if I'd gotten too intense. No, 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 not at all. We're, we're, we're very preoccupied at the university with, with teaching students how to evaluate information. We, we see it as something of, of a national emergency and, and many, many people do. Um, in this age of, of questionable, information, what suggestions do you have? Where, where can students find high quality information? I mean, I think that the trick is to, the, the trick is to not sort of become credulous about either the mainstream sources of information or the often more dubious alternatives. I, I think one thing that often happens to people is that they will notice some place where the mainstream consensus, maybe even the consensus that you find in the pages of the New York Times is wrong. And then having, or, you know, or get something that they know about wrong. And having had that kind of epiphany, then they go searching for other sources of information, find them and then assume that those other sources are correct. And it's that mistake that I think I, I would warn people against. I mean, I mean, the reality is that, you know, you can't completely trust any, any source of information. There's no perfect source of information. You know, as a media consumer, you should try and read a broad diet of you, or sort of take in a broad diet. You should absolutely read the New York Times, but you shouldn't take everything that appears in its pages as gospel, especially what op-ed columnists write. You can't really trust us. And, you know, and then you should supplement it. If you're reading the Times and a bunch of liberal publications, you should read more conservative publications too. If you're watching, you really shouldn't watch cable news ever. I was going to say, if you're watching MSNBC, you should watch Fox. But really, I think cable news is just bad and people shouldn't watch it and society would be better off without it. So don't watch cable news. And then on the internet, you know, just don't don't treat any source of information as a kind of guru or cult leader, basically. Like if you think Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself to pick some a sort of conspiratorial view, that's fine. You can think that. But if you then find a website run by someone who thinks Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, don't assume that everything the guy on that website is saying must be the gospel truth, because chances are it's not. I, so I would cultivate, 
you know, cultivate diversity in what you read and not a complete, but a, a reasonably strong skepticism about any single information source, mainstream or otherwise. So we're, we're coming up on time and we always like to end with, with something hopeful. Um, can you suggest one concrete act that a young person might undertake to help unite the nation in common purpose? Um, I mean, I, I think that in certain ways, you know, there, I mean, it, it depends on the, where the person is and right and, and who they are. I think for hyper educated young people, um, the kind who've acquired not just college, but graduate degrees. I think going and living and working sort of outside the sort of elite meritocratic bubble for a while um, is an incredibly healthy thing. This used to happen in journalism um, where, you know, if you were a young journalist, you might go to an elite college, but then you would go apprentice at, you know, a small newspaper in Western Nebraska or an upstate New York or, you know, wherever, and then sort of work your way back to working in Washington or New York or Chicago or something. So that by the time you got to the elite publication, you had experience of the world outside elite circles. So I think things like that can, you know, unfortunately, those kind of small newspapers have gone into steep decline. But to the extent that you can do that, can live and work in a place sort of unlike the place where you've been educated, that can be incredibly healthy. But I would also say like acts of radical commitment, getting married young and starting a family young, even if you're not sure you're ready, um, you know, is an act of sort of courage in the face of um, ennui and disillusionment, um, you know, joining a religious order, that, that kind of thing. So I think young people shouldn't our society sort of teaches young people to keep all their options open for extremely long periods of time. And sometimes that can be really good, but sometimes choosing options and living them out early can actually be the bolder of choice and the one with better effects for society as a whole. The book is The Decadent Society, America Before and After the Pandemic. It's available for purchase from an indie bookstore via a link on this screen. Thanks so much, Ross Douthat. Thanks so much for having me. Let me remind you that this and all our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel, and you can find them at The Conversation on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you wish to support future programming like this, you can make a donation at our website. To our audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Be well.